Hello everybody, James here. Story time with Dutch episode 59. There he is, the man with the moustache. Let's do a couple of plugs first. And we've got books. Uh, oh, God. I'm already slacking. I already told you this had <laughs> happened, Dutch. Owen Hart, King of Pranks, what I wrote. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, what I wrote. Two fine, fine tomes. You like that word as well. Tales from a Dirt Road by Dutch and the world according to Dutch. You can get all four of those on Amazon, but if you want Dutch's book signed, you email him at dirtydutchmantel with two L's at gmail.com. We've got two T-shirts that have fallen off down there, so I can't be bothered getting them, but it is uh, Respect the Stash, and you people mean nothing to me. You'll have seen them on uh, all the clips, I'm sure. If you want them, you go to the description or to the podcast, and there'll be a link there to buy them. Uh, give us five stars now, iTunes. All right, that is the intro done, Dutch. I always say this is like, my goodness me, we've got a lot to talk about, but my goodness me, we've got a lot to talk about. And the first thing is your recap we, we do. of your appearance on the Kenny Boland show. Well, it probably it's. I know it set a record for for his show, but it went for two hours and... It was fun to do it because we didn't really talk the ins and outs of wrestling. We just talked like two guys going down the road and bullshitting with each other and uh, actually an enjoyable, enjoyable two hours. I will say that sometimes you can do podcasts and it gets tedious and it gets this. I mean, if you're getting interviewed, not this show, of course, but uh, with Kenny, he's such a natural bullshitter that it just comes natural and it was good. So I, I enjoyed it and it probably be my last appearance. I probably appear on it twice. My first and last time so Kenny, I'm sorry. Don't beg me anymore because you've already embarrassed yourself enough. So don't get on your hands and knees and beg me publicly. Cause I'm not coming back home. <laughs> what was the, uh, what was the story that you found a little contentious that he was staying or if there was only just one, maybe there might've been more. No, no, it, well, it doesn't matter with Kenny. It doesn't matter. I, I was saying, Kenny, you always find a way to bring this, anything we're talking back uh, about, back to yourself. I said, you're the biggest narcissist I've ever known. And then he has a habit of like over talking you. And I had to reprimand him several times about, you know, Kenny, I'm talking, I'm talking, let me finish. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. But he actually got better during the podcast. He didn't talk over me so much. So. But, and you can find that wherever Kenny Boland's podcast is, just look it up. Yeah. Uh, his podcasts aren't released, they escape, is the old saying, I think. <laughs> um, before we go on to the first bit of news, we've got pff, an hour's worth of news easily here. But do you remember last week I made a prediction about what the collision rating would be? Do you remember, do you remember what the number was? Uh, I remember the number was a uh, four eighty five. No, 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 five, no. Uh, five eighty something. It was five hundred eighty, and I said five eight five. So that was my run of three See? intact, where I've publicly made a prediction of. Well, I've, I've, I've called like, you the yeah. yes, I've called you the Nostradamus of wrestling ratings. So what do you think? AEW. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think this week will be? Uh, because there's no CM Punk and Samoa Joe. Uh, my gut's telling me 520, because I don't know what's really being plugged on there. Maybe even less, but I'll I'll, I'll, well, I'll give them the benefit that they don't say 520. I'm not even going to predict anything, because I am horrible. I am horrible at predicting a rating. I, I really am. Well, just say the exact same thing as me, and then you'd be guaranteed to be right. No, I will say, what'd you say? A 520. I'll say five twenty-five. That's the spirit. Well, we're doing the prices right over under kind of thing. Yeah, you know, pri- <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll say five twenty-one. There you go. Uh, See, yeah, and the worst thing I did was tweet it, and then I accidentally wrote a w rampage instead of collision because I got the damn word wrong. But I forgot it. Right, let us get into the news and people. Oh, I, I don't. I forgot to mention this to you beforehand. This isn't even the news. When we posted uh, the show last week, it was uh, yeah. one of the best videos that it did was the WWE royalties chat. And more people were mm-hmm. disappointed to hear more of the numbers that you were paid for various things. Are you willing to do an itemized... Are you willing to do an itemized reading? Well, I don't even know where it is now. No. We'll do it next week. But, le- but, but listen, let me just say this. They, it is itemized down to the penny. 
to the, like, I had some royalties, and the royalties are long, but none of them are. Now, you got to, my position in WWE, I didn't sell a lot of merchandise. So I'm saying my check was kind of, well, I don't want to say embarrassing, but it would be embarrassing to to say an Undertaker check or a Triple H check or any of of those guys. But I had a couple of royalties, four cents, one cent. I even had a couple at one cent. I don't know what that means. But I've talked about the royalty system in the WWE. When they control everything, when they control control the product and the selling of the product, you don't know what they sold, really. All you know is what they put out. So, but I think WWE made a lot of money on say books and merchandising. And see, I've heard that. See, if I go to, if I go to a convention and I sell books and, you know, the photo and all this stuff, I already have a deal in place. Uh, But see WWE, they can sell the same stuff and say off a, a book, let's say, I might make $10 or $15 off a book at a convention, but I sign it and I do all this stuff. If they, if WWE sold it, I would make like a dollar and a half, dollar 75. And so you've got two books out as well. I do, and uh, those are great books, by the way. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even th- throw them at WWE because they would make a fortune with it, and I'd get a dollar a book. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's it's their business, and they handle it the way they want to handle it, which I don't agree with. But I'm not there, so it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Well, if uh, if we were, well, you know what our memories are like. We do okay, this podcast. Well, one- Yes. One more thing. Say somebody gets a guarantee of, let's say, $500,000, which is not bad to be in WWE. It's not good now compared to what some of those guys are making. But the 500000 includes all your royalties, too. Is it really? So, yes, all your royalties help make up your downside guarantee. But you can always make more people- on top of it, though. Like say you, you sell a lot of merchandise, whatever, then you'll get paid more on top you of can. that. And 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 if you don't make, say with me, my downside guarantee, I'm not going to say what it was, but they would always have to add to, <laughs> add add to my total to get me to where I was supposed to be, which is fair. I made the deal. I made the deal, and I I needed a position at the time, and they helped me out. And I don't ever want to say anything bad about WWE because they really rescued me when I need to be rescued. So I appreciate that. Triple H did that, by the way. And the um, the, the downside guarantee I give you on this podcast is a bag of balloons and a pencil every week. So that, it could be that's worse. it. And a phone <laughs> and a phone call and a phone call. So. And a phone call. Yeah. A nice free one. Uh, We will move on to the first bit of news. And this came up yesterday as we record this. So this will be Wednesday. This is Friday when it comes out. Mike Halleck, (laughs) a.k.a. Mantor, has died. Uh, Quite young, I think about 55 years old, under the Mantor gimmick. Mike made his WWF television debut at the very same WWF Raw taping that you did, 9th of January 1995. Now, he did do a dark match under Bruiser Mastino. Uh, he was Bruiser Mastino in Germany, working for Otto Vance for a few years in the mm-hmm. tours. You know, he's somewhere in the middle of the pack. And his cousin, for people who don't know, which I always think is a fun fact, he, uh, is the proto John Cena in WCW PN News. Now, uh, he was in the WWF for about six months. And a couple more fun facts was that he was part of the. Uh, he went to ECW at the end of '95, and everyone kept chanting Mantor at him. So then that run didn't work out. And then he was also briefly in the Truth Commission as Tank before he was replaced by whoever it was, Bull Buchanan or um, the other fellow from Germany, Recon or Sniper, whatever his name was. But you also have wrestled Mike Halleck. Um, speak about Mantor first I, and the character. 
Wait a minute. I wrestled him. You wrestled and lost to him in USWA. Oh, USWA. Yes. I don't remember that. You don't remember the losses, do you? You only remember the wins. Well, no, I, well, especially losses. I don't remember losses. No, he was okay. He was a, he was a big guy. I didn't particularly like the gimmick. It's not up to me. I mean, uh, it's up to the fans. But I don't think the fans understood the gimmick because they never uh, they never explained it. He comes out in Mantar with a tail, I guess. What is Mantar? What is it? I think it's some sort of a bastardization of the word Minotaur or something like some half man, half beast thing. But then he comes to the ring with a giant cow head on. That was it. But I don't think the people. I don't think they understood that because, hell, I didn't even understand it. So he went in the ring, and he was just a big guy, not very tall. He was about maybe six foot, maybe 5'11", but he's weighed back 350. And he moved well. He was a good athlete, but he just never caught on. And he was, And then he went with that truth commission, which is another thing that I didn't kind of understand. And the Truth Commission was a South African group supposed to be. And I never understood it. So, again, when you kind of leave the fans out of the equation of understanding what something is, then you've lost the war before you started it. I don't think Mantar had a chance of getting over in WWE. But a nice guy and nice to talk to, pleasant guy, but he didn't. I don't think they gave him a, a gimmick that was almost impossible to get over, unless they really going to push it. And I never saw. I, I couldn't see WWE pushing a gimmick like that. I, I can't imagine that you anywhere at the height of your powers in Puerto Rico, or whatever. If you just came out one week with a giant cow head, and then you took it off, and you had like horns painting on your eyes, and then and this is what yeah. Mike did was go moo. He would moo. <laughs> That might describe, that might probably explain why he didn't get over. <laughs> Are you not seeing box office? And, you know, if you just write that character down, do you not just, like, have dollar signs in your eyes? Oh, oh, man. But, but what, it, they may have had dollar signs when they wrote it down, but it turned into nickel signs. I mean, <laughs> it just never, it, it, it was just, no, you know, when you see something, and we're going to talk about L.A. Night, I think, a little bit later. Uh, the next question, in if, fact. Okay. Well, when, we'll get to it now, and I'll tell you the difference well, between well, them. Well, before, before I do, I, I want to bring up that the character of a big cow head, bull head, bison head, whatever it was, uh, wasn't unique in a sense, because I think Moose Cholak did this kind of thing first. I don't know if you know anything about the Moose Man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he was he was pushed a little bit, Moose Cholak. You know, he was a big guy, and he went in there and actually beat people up. Mentor, uh, man, Mantar, or whatever his name was, was never really – he was on TV, but he was just there. See what I mean? I mean, you've seen matches that one guy wins, but it's not memorable or anything, and so it just goes into that that storage tank. So you dump this at the earliest possible convenience, and you throw it out. He never did anything memorable, even with the Truth Commission. They tried to do a little bit with them, but they didn't click either. No. Uh, do you remember who Mantor's uh, manager was? He was a South African. Nope. That was uh, that was a Truth Commission. Do you remember who when he was the bull man? Mantor? No, I do not. I, I do not. Jim Cornette. <laughs> now we know why Jim doesn't talk talk about that Mantor <laughs> connection. <laughs> there you go. He thought it was a practical joke when they kept saying to walk out with him. Right, so the next bit of news is The Rock versus L.A. Knight on Twitter. Now, L.A. Knight took to Twitter to claim that he had a better Madison Square Garden debut than the great one, adding that Johnson's debut attire was cringe and never wants to shy away from a challenge. Johnson hit back on Twitter, saying to L.A. Knight, man, you're right, that outfit was so cringe. Here's what's more cringe, the fact that you look and sound like you dropped out of some jabroni's balloon knots. Nice haircut, you outback jack-off. There you go. Uh, that, was a, that was a great, that was a great comeback. But I will say, <clears throat> L.A. Knight is, <clears throat> he's getting over big time. When they took him away from the maximum male models, and I predicted that the maximum male models with, and I've even forgot the name that he used then, 
they were dead on arrival, and they were. But at least they saw the the worth in L.A. Knight, and they dumped the maximum male models and kept L.A. Knight. Now, he has a certain vibration about him, a vibe, they say, when he walks down to the ring. And it's a little bit, I, I get a little bit of uh, Stone Cold vibe when I see him. Oh, uh, yeah, even more, even more than The Rock. But he's a great talker, good worker. And the people like him. They won't. Uh, sometimes you can be, be almost even being a heel. I've seen this a lot of times. You put a performer out there, you want the people to dislike him. But yet, on the other hand, they go the other way. So you have to listen to them because if you continue to push him as a heel, the fans rebel on you. We don't want to see him that way. We want to, we kind of like him. And I did read a thing the other day and why he's getting over you. They look at merchandise sales. Uh, this guy's number one, this girl's number two, or this, you know, is a female wrestler's number two and number three. Number... No longer than, than he's been there. He's already number four in merchandise sales. And he was number four in losing matches. He lost about, I don't know, five in a row, six in a row. But it doesn't matter because the fans are telling the promotion, listen, we'll support this guy if you put him in something. And if you put him in something, now what's that tell WWE? Oh, if we make him more high profile, more merchandise will sell, which is true. So... I want to, I want to commend him on doing a, a a great job. He was doing this same thing in TNA, but TNA was kind of clunky at the time. This is the Eli but Drake days, wasn't it? Eli Drake, and it was the same deal. Hey, let me talk to you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and he was Eli Drake, and he had it all down. And I think what, what happened, he went up there and they wanted to make him something that he wasn't, that he had trouble. I mean, the maximum male models, uh, when he was there, he did a good job. It was just a, a crappy gimmick. And the people are looking at it and they're saying, ah, we don't like this, which is they're the arbiter of whether something gets over. They're the arbiter of whether they buy tickets or they sell merchandise, they buy pay-per-views. Those are your judges. Those is what you got to measure everything against. But L.A. Knight, I think, with him losing matches and being saddled with that damn career killer, maximum male models, and he came out the way he did, it's got to tell you something. Mm -hmm. And even The Rock... Rock's not stupid either. Rock knows he's over. So he's working this, this little social media, little gig. And they may have, so you, you got to pay attention to that because if they get it cooking on social media, well, what's the hierarchy in WWE going to do? They say, well, maybe Rock wants to do something. And they know bringing the rock back in anything is, is money in the bank anyway. But if he wants to be there and he wants to say he wants to work with LA Knight, we'll let him do it. Mm -hmm. It'd be a great WrestleMania match and a great, I don't think it would be the main event, but it would be a hell of an undercard. And I would actually be interested in seeing that match. I've seen a, a Hundred thousand matches. Well, maybe not that many, but I would actually be interested in seeing that match. Hmm. So, if you can interest me, I think you can in interest the, the casual fan. They'd be a lot of them. Now, there's a prevailing attitude uh, among fans, or belief, I should say, that when a performer gets themselves over, and it wasn't quite in the plans, sometimes WWE isn't that supportive of it. And I think like one of the most famous examples might have been Daniel Bryan, when you were in the company, in fact, around 2014 yep. or 20, whichever it was when it was WrestleMania 30. 
and you just by sheer force of will the fans kept cheering kept cheering kept disrupting segments until they just couldn't ignore them any longer do you think that do you, one do you think that's true that wwe isn't always you know they want to push who they want to push and the fans have got to like it or lump it and was that the case then and is it the case now it's not the case now then yes <clears throat> because you had a different guy really in charge vince was in charge and it's going to be his way or no effing way. And because you could get over naked cherry, but Vince, sometimes he's stubborn. He's Irish. McMahon, he's Irish. He said, no, by God, I'm going to, I don't care what they do. And he didn't care. But now I think if they care, they're good. And they were telling him then, except he didn't listen. He didn't want to listen. Because he didn't want to be uh, uh, deemed wrong. Now, a thing he did that I think people almost roasted him over was even uh, the uh, Roman Reigns turn. Because he was such a, a big, good guy, big baby face when he left. And brought him back as a heel. And the people didn't like that. And they fought that and fought it and fought it. And... But your determination and your stubbornness can pay off. But Vince kept with him and kept with him and kept with him, even when things were down. And then they started building this story around Roman and the uh, and the family. And finally, they got it to where it is today, and it's over, big time over. Now, if you put – now, if you – I'll say 10 months ago. Maybe, maybe a year ago. You had Roman Reigns, and that was about it. Because then everybody fell off the table. But now since that time, they uh, they got Roman Reigns and the Usos hot. Sami Zayn got hot. Kevin Owens got hot by osmosis just going in and helping. Mm -hmm. Then they got Gunther hot. He, he's, he's cracked up. Cody? And and Cody came over, but Cody came over with that built-in story. Mm. And now they're getting L.A. Night hot. So now when you put all those on, on the card, you've got a hell of a presentation. Because on big shows, everything you can, even back in the territorial days, when you did a big show, you brought all your angles together from the first match on. I've actually seen cards which had like four main events. And I mean, that's just for the fans, four main events. But it was your hottest things you had going in a territory, in a company at the time. And it worked. So they're bringing, <clears throat> they're bringing all these things together and, and they will peak them, believe me, they will peak them at SummerSlam, uh, at WrestleMania next year. Mm. Speaking of which, uh, SmackDown is pretty much setting records at the moment on network television. Last Friday's segment was described as an all-time classic with the Uso solo, Roman. And did you watch it? Oh, yeah, I did. And I was thinking at the time, wow, what a long segment, which is highly, highly un-WWE-ish. But now... Say the network was upset. It went too long, and that people were in the back. It's going too long. It's going too long. Till, till they looked at the ratings. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they go, oh, we hated too long. What the hell? Over 3 million viewers because it kept building, and it kept building, and it kept building, and they waited for that moment for something to happen. It did, so it all paid off. Now I've been I've been saying this for years. WWE used to make a habit of telling the story, a story within the story. You remember those days? Mm -hmm. Or maybe maybe you don't remember those days. But they would start out, say with Brian Pillman, and he's waiting on Steve Austin in a cabin somewhere and out in the woods, and it's Austin's place. And they would put a camera in the car with Austin, and Austin's going there. And he said, all right, I'm going to be there, you son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. And they would show it early. Then they'd show it in, like, 
in the top of the hour, and then they show it again. And at the very end, they would they would play that story off. So this is basically what they did here. They just did it in in uh, in one in one take in one segment. And when they peaked at three million, when's the last time a wrestling show did three million viewers? Oh, you're really going to put me on the spot now. I know that this was one of the best viewerships for SmackDown total since maybe 2020, if not the best since 2020. And, no, it was, yeah. it was huge. It was huge. So, and when uh, Fox saw that number, hmm, that really increased WWE's uh, worth in their eyes. And advertisers... Uh, it, it now it, it woke them up to what wrestling can do done right. Mm -hmm. And I've said this for, I've said this for months. Uh, they have done this angle, right? They, they, they had patience with it, took their time with it and they never went so far. You know, sometimes you can go too far. You can't back it up because sometimes you can go too far. <clears throat> then you realize you've done the wrong thing but they've never done so far that they've done the wrong thing and had to back it up. And when you do that, you've lost your angle. They have not lost the angle yet. And it's still, and it's gone. It's gone. It's been going on for three years done. Right. It can probably go and adding people in and taking people out. It could probably go another couple of years. There's loads of Samoans out there. If the, the more can be added, surely. No, no kidding. I mean, <laughs> If you want to get a wrestling business, have some Samoan heritage. <laughs> that's, all, that's all you're going to say. Hey, I'm Samoan. Hey, you know, I'm a, look at me. I got to, <laughs> but they, they did this. They did the story, right? I mm -hmm. would say triple H and I'm not saying he's, he, he's all that's, that's doing it, but whoever's writing this, they know how to write. And when's the last time you heard that about the creative team in WWE? Man. So... See, the thing about being on a creative team, when things are down, oh, creative, they, they're so stupid. They're the stupidest SOBs in the world. They're, they're, they're... But when it's going good like this, they all praise their performers. They always praise, you know, say Rock and, uh, I mean, not Rock, but uh, Roman and the Usos, but that idea had to come from creative. See, creative gets all the blame when it's down and they get no praise or support when it's up. I bet Heyman's but involved it, in this. I, I, I think Heyman's got his hand in this long-term storytelling. I actually had an answer for you on when mm -hmm. WWE's uh, long-term storytelling was this good, and, I'll, and I've got an answer for you. I think mm -hmm. it was... 2000 and i'll tell you why because after vince russo left they brought in several writers and i cannot remember the guy's name maybe it was matt something but they brought in this writer who would actually bring in a storyboard into creative meetings and it wasn't like a huge amount of people sat around a table but a few people and he would basically story arc for months in advance with storyboards and with what we did beforehand where we're going today what we're doing in the next three weeks so there would be consistency throughout and as soon as he left, that's when the storyline started getting more, as we've seen with Vince so many times, oh, no one will remember that and just do whatever. And then there's less consistency in the long term. So uh, as far as consistency goes, probably 2000. Well, the fans don't forget. And they don't forget mm -hmm. anything that the Usos do or Roman does or anybody else. They'll think back three months ago, uh, six months ago. Hey, no, no, no. Well, that makes it's like watching a movie, and all of a sudden you said, "Wait a minute, that doesn't even fit in here. That doesn't even make sense." So you got to stay consistent to the story, and they have. So my hats off to them. Next order of business: Brian Pillman Jr.'s contract with AEW has expired, and the two look to be going their separate ways. He had a name and a good look. Of the times that you saw him, what did you make of his ability? Which one, Junior? Junior, yeah. Oh, he's a good. He's a good. He's a uh, good worker, but, and he's got the name. I don't know how many people still really remember the name Brian Pillman. I just brought it up. That's old, old time fans like, well, I'm not an old time fan. I'm just old, but, <laughs> but uh, he, he does well. 
And I think he's probably wanting to go like everybody else. He wants to go to WWE and see what he's going to make there. WWE could probably do him more good because they got all that Brian, his his, da- his father's stuff, and he's trying to live. And they could tell a great story with that. So, and I, I have noticed that WWE, that they do have a, what do you call this, uh, a legacy, a legacy program. Hence the Samoans, Roman and you know, Afa and Sika and the Usos, and they're all Samoan and the heritage. The Rock's daughter in NXT. There's loads of kids, wrestlers, yeah, kids, yeah. third generation. They, they have the legacy program, Cody. Is another one. D- Dustin would be uh, another one, and Brian Pillman Jr. is is another one, and they love that because now people. It's not see when you take somebody like uh, Brian Pillman out there, and you say, "Wait a minute, Pillman wasn't even if you don't remember that much like me, but you would think, well, is they used to have a Pillman guy that was kind of a nut." And they could probably take that and, and and could do well with it because he's not coming in trying to get over just as another guy. He's coming in under his father's name, and I call it the legacy, and, and see what he can do. I mean, he has – I think he has got a total interest from the beginning mm-hmm. and it's a lot easier to work with that and work with, you know, just a, unknown and get him over uh, you can tell me more than I can tell you, I'm sure, on this. But as far as I can tell with Brian Pillman in AEW, he was in there for a bit at first. He seems to be featured a tiny bit. And then these last couple of years, you barely hear from him. So it yeah. just seems like he was as lost in the shuffle as could possibly be. Well, that's what happens in AEW. You see these guys, and all of a sudden you don't see these guys. For weeks and weeks and weeks, and you may not even see them at all. I don't know what the problem is there. I heard it had 180 guys under Probably. contract or something. I don't know if he's paying them all, but but he's got he's got three shows. So, but he's still you, you might still not see the guy for months or, or at least weeks. I don't know that they got their they got their own thing going there, and I try I try to stay out of the AEW stuff. John. Moxley recently gave an interview uh, defending his use of blood in matches. Now, this actually came from, you you probably saw the photo of him with a bunch of like skewers sticking out the top of his head. Did you see that photo? Is that a real photo? That is a real photo. So this was from some death match of of a week ago. What is sticking out of his head? They're almost like wooden skewers, you know, like chicken skewers, I think. I don't get it. How could he get – he had like 50 in his head. Yeah. I thought it was a joke photo. No, I think I think they are real jabbed in his head. I don't know about that. Do we have to pause but, this and really study it? Yeah, well, I think. Okay, I saw it. I don't know how they got that many in his head. Okay, I'm pausing so we can look at the photo. Okay, we found the photo we we're both looking at. I'm going to show the main camera first that so how many do you think are in i don't know 30 20 30 maybe more i don't know what do you think um too many 20 30 more than i'd be willing to take in my head yeah but i thought we were talking about bleeding in matches we were but I, i think it was this sort of came around the same time he was giving an interview where he was talking about why he bleeds so much in so many matches and his answer is essentially well people bleed in real fights so why wouldn't you bleed in uh pro wrestling or a death match or anything like that i agree 100 percent with what he said they bleed in real fights so why wouldn't you bleed in wrestling Mm -hmm. but why would you have skewers (laughs) in your head (laughs) In a real fight, <laughs> see that. See that it doesn't even make sense to me. Mm. See, you got to be very careful with that too, because if you become known as a as a bleeder, people expect it all the time. And there's a reason they got rid of blood and wrestling, unless it's uh, it's 
be, uh, gotten legitimately, but because uh, TV stations didn't want it. They didn't want to be bloody guts. Now, you know, TV stations, you could used to couldn't hit a woman on TV either in wrestling. Oh God, you do that. You'd be, you'd be the worst of the worst. Now, hell you're beating the crap out of them. Nobody gives a crap anymore. So things change. And uh, as for me, I've never liked the, the blood in wrestling so much. And I didn't mind it when the other guys did it. I'm saying I I was a chicken. I didn't I didn't want to. I just see my head's not too bad. See there, mm-hmm. you can't hardly you can't even hardly tell it. But I, I thought one time, what if I got hurt real bad? And I couldn't wrestle anymore, and I'd have to go get a job. So you're sitting there doing the interview, right? The, oh yeah, I can come in at nine o'clock in the morning or eight or whatever, and blah blah blah. But your your hair your head looks like a road map. Yeah. It looks like a road map when I seventy five and I four split up. Oh, you know. So I I told Carlos Colon that one time. I told Abby that too. They didn't think it was too funny. But anyway, I was I'm never a big proponent uh, of, of of blood in wrestling. What what is because I know you were once we've already told the story where one time you did some sort of like half death match thing on the indies and the guy said, "Hey, it'll be fun." But what is the oddest? And you beat him up, uh, and he didn't seem it was so think it was so fun afterwards. But what is the oddest weapon you've ever seen used? Hmm. I've seen drills. What? D- drills. You know, like you like an electric eat. drill. Yes, I've seen that. What? Actually, I saw that the other day. Somebody took a drill and in somebody's head, and. It, Listen, these are these are all independent guys. They can they could do it. Saws. Uh, I've seen that. I've seen all kind of stuff. But but if they come at me with with one of those instruments of damage, I'm knocking them out because you're not going to do that to me. I, I I don't I don't consent. It's like the police want to search your car. I don't consent to search my car, and I don't consent to you even looking looking at that instrument to use on me. It's just, you know, sometimes you can go down to the independent level. They can do anything. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Our last bit of news, and I've left this for the main event. I'm going to try not to say too much on this, but mm-hmm. because I want you to speak on it. But Vince Russo and the self-pity tweet. Mm-hmm. Vince Russo, a couple of days ago, posted the following with a very sad, greyed-out, black-and-white picture of him uh, at his little booth. Man, sometimes it just gets tough. I would love to stop watching WWE Raw. I would love to stop critiquing the show. Unfortunately, I am paid good money to do so, and bills still have to get paid. I look forward to a time when I can eliminate pro wrestling from my life altogether. It's a curse, because it has brought on deep depression over years, but it's also a blessing because I was good at it, which enabled me to still pay the bills through it some 32 years later. Truthfully though, at the end of the day, I wish I have just chosen another profession. If I'm going to be completely honest, it chose me, I didn't chose it. Which is how he wrote it. Your reactions to making public that kind of tweet? Vance, I'm going to give you some words of advice. <clears throat> Keep those emotional feelings bottled up inside of you because all you do is you just give fans just more reason to really roast you more on social media. Now, a lot of people don't like Ben so I like the guy. And I didn't agree with a lot of his ideas, but I will say that Vince is a workaholic. He'll work from go to woe. <clears throat> and he has a lot of ideas. But that's what you want in a creative team. You want ideas. And the worst idea that I've ever heard is the one that's not that's not advertised, that's not even pitched. Pitch it even if it's a crap, because it might get you somewhere else. So and I can see watching too much, you get burned out on it. 
and you don't enjoy it anymore. Now, and I can kind of sympathize with him because I was watching SmackDown during those months when it was really horrible, really horrible. And I could say nothing good about it. See, when you're reporting on a show and you can say nothing good about it, it just looks like you're just slamming the show just for the sake of slamming the show. But no, <clears throat> the show was terrible. The show, I mean, I used to say that sometimes the ratings go up at the end because the people go to sleep watching the show and they don't wake up till the show's off. So it carries the TV, your TV. Uh, signal, it carries that into the ratings that you didn't even watch it. The show puts you to sleep. But if you have a good segment, like we were just talking about, like the Usos and Roman, the tribal uh, court, the trial, I've never seen that done, ever. Now, I've had wrestler's court. That's probably where it came from. We used to have wrestler's court in the dressing room as a joke. But WWE, they took that when The Undertaker got there, <laughs> and they developed that into a uh, an art. And sometimes it, it was actually, they would convict guys and actually carry out a sentence on them. See, when I invented Rest Record, it was just a joke. You know, it was like a little five to ten minute trial, and, you was, and it was that bullshitting down the road. and But it made the, made the trip go faster. But... I can see back to Vince. I can see him getting burned down on it because you can only watch so much of something before it just all blends together. And he's watching Raw, and I think SmackDown is a lot better than Raw. And when you think that Raw is three hours and SmackDown is only two, the ideal time, I think, for a wrestling show is 90 minutes. I think that's what Memphis had, 90 minutes. And we could do just enough wrestling to interest the people, but not burn them out. I think when you go two hours and over, you're kind of you're kind of pushing the pendulum then to get them to stay. So Vince, I hope you get over your oh your little uh emotional tirade you went through. Maybe Raw will get better because I'm sure Vince wants to see something good that he can kind of put over. But until he sees that, I don't know. Now, next week, next week, I think Vince might be completely different. He might be all excited about something, which I'd rather see in that way than the way he's in, in right now. So, Vince, cheer up, buddy. It has to get better. Has to. My turn now. Yeah, go with ahead. Vince, you just talking <laughs> about it just pisses me right off. Because if there's one thing <laughs> I can't fucking stand, it's a bunch of whiny little bitches crying about their <laughs> first world problems. Oh no, I have to watch Raw and then write about it and get paid for it. Sat on your fat ass, you twat. Right, let me tell you this, Dutch. I <laughs> yesterday was yeah. working twelve hours. Uh, from yes. 7 till 7. I had to do two interviews, I had to do the script. It is very stressful because I've got to do a lot of research and then I've got to be like five hours under these lights and it's a very hot room and it's very draining. I understand that plot in a sense. Yes. thought you got air conditioning. It's too loud to put on. Every single time okay. I talk, it, like the microphone kicks and it goes... It sounds like a jet engine in the corner. So all of, I'm still in a hot room. <laughs> but like this self-pitying bullshit... like. Here's an idea. Why don't you, well, if you hate it so much, why don't you just quit and do a proper job? Because this is the kind of comment from someone who's never apparently had a proper job in their entire life. My first job was landscaping at 16, carrying like cement blocks and everything else. It's a tough job. My second job was barrowing concrete. That means wheelbarrowing, wheelbarrows full of concrete and doing end runs back and forth for hours on end. And I was so like weedy, I couldn't even lift the barrow. Right. This was like when I was 18. Uh, mm -hmm. Another hard job I did was working behind a bar. I hated that job because I was the only one there and there were three deep at the bar at all times on a Friday and Saturday night. Hated that job. They're difficult jobs that you get paid nothing for. I presume that Russo gets paid better than minimum wage to watch Raw from the comfort of his own air-conditioned house. Even mine's not air-conditioned at the moment for it. 
it's this first world problem nonsense. I I have no time for it at all. How much more do you want me to say on this? Oh, this. Oh, here we go. Hey, that that is quite a uh, frenzy that you went through. Oh, it's fine. I've got okay. more. Um, this like this whole like the thug life chose me. I didn't choose it. Horseshit. Right, for, no, I, I, no, I, I don't, I don't agree with he, that. Right, let me tell you how much wrestling chose him is that he. Uh, I think the story is is that there's a guy called John Arezzi who had like yeah. a radio show. He ended up healing his way onto that by just somehow announcing himself as the co-host, even though he was only meant to be a sponsor. And then after ninety days, that that relationship exploded. I think he ended up courting WWF during the steroid probe and basically trying to get, to ingratiate them himself to the WWF by giving them favorable coverage while all this was going on. And then I don't know how he got to the WWF, but I'm sure that he called them, they didn't call him. And he quit the WWF and called WCW and um you know, he went back to TNA a few times as well. This is all wrestling is not choosing him. He is choosing to stay in the business that he quote unquote hates and has made him depressed for years. So if it's just if it's that bad for you, here's an idea. Why don't you go to Walmart and work for minimum wage there? And we'll see how depressed you are compared to what you were doing beforehand. Why don't you do like a proper job where you've got to leave the house and you've got a nine to five and we'll see how yeah. that works out for you. Yeah, Vince, won't you do that? Yeah. Now I have to hear him this. Hey, fuck you, Vince. <laughs> you damn little whiny ass down bitch. Straighten up and do your job. Yeah. By God. Also, you also Vince, you're doing the exact same job as Dutch. He reviews three hours of wrestling every week and he's never complained once. About no, the, you I, complain I, about I, SmackDown, I, but you you don't complain about getting paid for watching wrestling. <laughs> well, the the deal about wrestling is you know how I watch it, especially SmackDown. Mm. I don't sit there at eight o'clock and I'm sitting there because I know some matches I can just fast forward through. So I tape it to about I don't know eight thirty, so I don't miss too much or a little more, and I start watching it about quarter to nine and I see the opening and see what's coming up. And then I see the first match and catch the finish. And then I run through the commercials because I don't want to see them to the next match. And if I think they're getting ready to do something, I'll stay and watch it. If not, I'll kind of speed through that because I'm getting to the top of the hour. See what they're going to do there. And toward the end. That's when the stuff happens. And as they, you always do it at the top of the hour, starting out what you got then the top of the next hour. And you'll watch, if you watch the clock, WWE is never in commercial at the top of the hour. If it says, uh, see, it starts at eight o'clock Eastern time at eight 58, they're coming back in with the with the live action and then hit a run to about seven or eight after and then take off and at the top of the hour you know they're closing it out but what was unusual about smackdown is they did uh, the trouble uh court in the first hour and they went over and they did that monster rating so now creative is sitting back saying hmm if we do something interesting, we can go over because they can make up commercials. They can make that time up. If not that night, you know, they're, they'll get a credit and they'll make it up some other time. But for that 3 million viewership rating that they did, and it's not a record, of course, but for this time and age, it was a, it was an eye opener. Mm -hmm. So they, I think there's a lot of talk going on. And, you know, Triple H, it had to make him feel like ecstatic to get that rating under his watch. And, but I don't think Vince liked it too much. Personally, I'm saying that business-wise, yeah, he loved it. Because that makes WWE uh, a hell of a, a hell of a, a property to have. Endeavor is very, very excited. Now, talking about that, when is the Endeavor and the WWE merger going to finally be officialized? Uh, later on this year, I think they gave that. Uh, I think they gave that uh, nod to, unless it's early next year, but it, I think it was going to be later on this year. 
Oh, good. Anyway, Vince, buck up, buddy. Do your job. And or, or quit and get a difficult job. Simping, yeah. pathetic. <laughs> oh, oh. What? <laughs> I, just, I, I have no time for. I have no time for. I can see myself in the camera. I'm getting redder and redder and redder. If I had your mustache, I would be Yosemite Sam. Just go oh. like that. But I just, just that wanted... actually upset. That actually upset you, didn't it? Yeah. Do you know why? Because why? I work really hard at this, yeah. and I don't have a famous name at all to be doing this. As I'm looking at Vince Russo's channel, I can tell you that uh, our uh, our YouTube channel outdraws his ten to one. Mm -hmm. uh, which pleases me greatly. Really? Yes, I'm looking. In the last 30 days, it brought in 135,000 views. Hours brought in maybe like 1.3 million in the last really? 30 days. So yeah, it's done well. Anyway, uh, I. but the thing is, I work so hard. Wait, and, ha, ha, wait a minute. How much did it bring in? i got to figure up something here. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, go ahead. Well, well, go ahead. Well, well, let me tell you exactly why. It's because... Yes, I work. I do work hard of this. You know, I put in far more than the average nine to five. And I know you don't know exactly what I do with this, but uh, you know, I do put in a lot of effort. I've got a couple of people that help me out now as well. But here's what I don't do: is as difficult as I find this job sometimes, and sometimes it can be trying. What I don't do is say how ungrateful I am, because there is of the people watching now. I'm sure a good proportion of them would give their left arm to be paid a full-time wage, that arm right there, uh, or their mm -hmm. left nut, some, some of them probably, to be like, to be in a position where you can make this a job, where you can sit here and you can talk to Dutch or you can talk to Al Snow, or you, you know, you can you can make this a an actual profession. You can make this a vocation. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm as much as I'm sure I complain to my family and friends about this job sometimes when it's a bit tiring, I realize how lucky I am to be in this position. And then Vince Russo, on, conversely, is looking about how unlucky he is to be in this position, where he gets to sit at home, make his own hours, I'm sure, for the most point, and basically throw it in the face of people who do have to work jobs that they hate and are far more difficult. And I think that's unacceptable, in my opinion. The thing I like about this job, and when I used to have jobs, and I've had jobs, you have to get up and go to it. Yes. And sometimes at ungodly hours of the morning. Rain like, or shine. Rain or shine. And it, yeah. And WWE, I was thinking about the travel uh, uh, that WWE put you through. It's it's brutal. You know, you I did it. And somebody said, oh, well, just flying to somewhere else. That's not too bad. No, it's not. But when you, when you fly to get there, you're not done. <laughs> then you got to go and get, rent a car. Then drive 200 miles. So you might be leaving, uh, getting up in the morning at four o'clock in the morning and getting to the airport for a 730 flight. And then you land at 1130, then go rent a car, then go rent a room and spend a couple hours there, then ride 200 miles and then drive back. And you might get back at, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning. That's a 22 hour day. But, you know, if you enjoy it and you're making good money, you can do that. I mean, not every day is like that, but I have had almost 36 hour days, hmm. like coming from Europe back to the States. I mean, you would leave, you would leave London and fly back and then go right to raw, then go right to somewhere else. I'm so, I don't know. I'm so pleased it's, you brought it's, that it's, up. It's, I'm so pleased you brought that up because Russo used to work for the WWF having to be on the same schedule as Vince McMahon. He must mm -hmm. know that he's had it a lot harder because that is, a, I imagine, an incredibly difficult job. So I'll bring it back slightly. That's a That must be a well, terrible job. I don't think I could do it. Well, in creative and WWE, Vince would get those writers up. Vince would get into a town, then he'd go work out. Yeah. Then while he's working out with his, and he, he would take his trainer with him too. And him and the trainer would be at the gym. They'd find him a 24 hour gym and Vince would get all puffed up, but the, he's, he'd get to thinking. Then he'd get all the writers up. Hey, meet me in my room at four o'clock in the morning. Wait a minute. You just got there at maybe one, two, you getting up and going to a 
to his room at four and rewriting the show. And you may attempt to rewrite the show. And Vince is in a mood, raising hell, throwing stuff. Then you get you got then you got to show up at the building at about eleven thirty in the morning, and then the writing may not be done. And then you're continuing to write. I've been there sometimes on Raw, and they tore the whole script up at four thirty, and they were rewriting the whole show between four thirty and six thirty. Hmm. Then you and you may not you was on the show, and all of a sudden you may not even be on the show, or your opponents change or whatever. But sometimes. And you could tell what mood Vince was in when you go into the building. You just have to go by the writer's room. Where the, the, they have a little writer's room with, you know, their little laptops and all this. If they're joking around <laughs> and zippity do that, you know, if they're in a good mood, you know, Vince is either not there or he's okay. But if you go by there and all the writers are like this, oh, God, oh, God. You know, Vince is on a rampage. So the writers would tell me that. They'd say, oh, oh boy, Vince is in a mood today. And I said, oh, God. So, And I would steer clear of him like everybody else would. I just didn't want to get in his line of sight. Because unheard, unseen, and unknown. And that's what I actually wanted to be. I just wanted to pick the check up. To, uh, to wrap this up, uh well, we've already said it all anyway. But, you know, you can't actually tell this, Vince, unless uh, he follows you because he's blocked anybody who doesn't follow him from replying to that tweet. We are now going to draw a line under that. I'm going to go, like, D-Red. And we are actually going to talk about our main topic of this podcast. <laughs> but when I say we, it's not going to be me and you. It's going to be our special guest and you to talk about the life and death of Bruiser Brody. So I'm going to pause this. For a second. Well, oh, okay. let me let me oh. let me say one thing before we get. I have a special guest today, fans, and you you don't know who he is, but you will. His name is Sean McEwen, and he's a TV. Uh, I mean, a movie producer, uh, and he's a writer, and he's a director, and he wants to make a movie about professional wrestling, and about a guy that very controversial guy. And by the name of Bruiser Brody, who, and I brought this up to, brought this up to James, I don't know, probably a couple of weeks ago. And he says, why don't we do a show devoted because the 17th of July, 16th and 17th of July really marks the 35th anniversary of Bruiser Brody's death. And Sean is going to make a movie are considering making a movie about Bruiser Brody. And I think, I don't think a wrestling, a wrestling movie has been made in how long years, right? Uh, yeah. There is one in production about the Von Erics at the moment, but that's all I know about. Well, yeah, Bruiser Brody's is different. So, Hey, don't go away. Stay with us. We're going to get Sean on the line and we're going to start talking uh, movie making and Bruiser Brody. Uh, one second. Okay, we've got our guest on the line now, and I'm going to throw it to Dutch to introduce him for our chat, or their chat, I should say, about Bruiser Brody. So uh, introduce the guest, please. Well, I'm going to introduce a man that I met about three years ago, two years ago, and, and uh, he described a project that he wanted me to be involved in, and it was a movie about Bruiser Brody. Uh, you may not recognize his name, but you will, you will be interested and what he has planned. Sean, are, are you with us? I am. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to speak to you, Dutch. Where are you now? Um, well, I'm actually, you know, listen, I'm such a fan of the deep South. That I'm as deep South as you can get. I'm in Australia. So, uh, really? so yeah, so it's about, it's about 1am here, but, um, but yeah, so we're, we're holding the fort down under. Well, we appreciate you, you joining us. And, uh, I told James the story about you and he said, man, and we looked at the calendar, and July the 16th, July the 17th marks the 35th anniversary of Bruiser Brody's death. That's and I right. was there. And when you first contacted me about, I don't know, a year or so, two years or whatever it was, and you explained what you wanted to do, I was all in on it. 
And uh, then I got to quizzing you. I said, how did you know really about this? Are you a wrestling fan? And you told me you were a big wrestling fan. And it, it just went from there. So what interested you in this story about Bruiser Brody? Well, I think, and first of all, again, it's such a pleasure to speak to you. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of you in particular. And so it's oh, that's, an that's good. to connect. That's, did I, did that's, I say that, that like we rehearsed? Oh, that, that, uh, that was great. That was great. <laughs> no, 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 for, for real. And I think, um, you know, I had, I grew up in the, the St. Louis area and I had family pretty much strung out from St. Louis down to Northern Arkansas and the Memphis area. And that's wrestling country, wrestling country. Yeah. It really is. I mean, it is. St. Louis, you know, with wrestling at the chase and the Mid South wrestling and Memphis. And I, I, I'll call it this and forgive me and don't, don't strangle me through the camera here, but Jerry Lawler country. And um, so I, you know, I grew up like it was embedded in the sort of cultural tapestry it of is. that region. Yeah. So I think to answer your question, that was maybe not the main thing. We'll come back to bruiser as a person uh, and as an icon himself, but but I think really that that cultural aspect and that regionalism aspect was what attracted me first and foremost because it was so embedded into like you know uh, everything like who we were as kids and growing up and following wrestling and you know my my dad my uncle watched it it really was that thing where you stopped everything you were doing and you got in front of the television and you immersed yourself it was immersive. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, and I think that, you know, for me, that was a big inspirational part of wanting to talk about that time and place. I think that's a really important and interesting aspect of it. Well, 35 years since Bruiser Brody's death, and I have heard a nearly only person who's ever contacted me because I was there that night. You're the only person who's ever contacted me about doing any kind of a documentary or a movie uh, on Bruiser Brody's career, his life, and his death uh, that's ever contacted me. And, yeah, I was all in on it because I was a big Brody fan. And I used to love to watch him go to the ring. I used to love to watch people run from him. And I put a thing up on Twitter the other day. I said, now, this is how you make an entrance. And he went to the ring and people were scattering. He didn't need music. He didn't need a spotlight. He brought all that with him to the ring. And he was his own show wrapped in one. And then he got in the ring and he did, he just did Bruiser Brody. He was only one and they were, I don't think there'll be another one. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's probably an overused term, but you definitely got your money's worth. I think, and I think, you know, everybody from the fans, even the promoters saw that he was a superstar. And, you know, in an era where, you know, um, the, the, you know, the individual kind of reigns supreme, unlike once the corporatization of the business, if I could dare speak about that, yeah. uh, came into play where it became more about the brand name uh, of, of the boss, shall we say, um, you know, this was a different time and place. And I think, again, that's what's so fascinating about this. I, I, I have a question for you about that, that I've always been fascinated. Now, you, as I understand it, you never got in the ring with Bruiser, even though you were around him a lot. Is no. it? Am I? understand that correctly and why was that was it just something that just never crossed because i didn't like to get the dog shit beat out of me that's one thing <laughs> sure. okay. because that's, that's yeah. what got him over he would just he just beat guys up i mean yeah. i mean not literally but he was he was a little tougher and a little stiffer that we say than the ordinary guy see brody he had one style his you either worked his style or you didn't have you didn't have a choice, but yeah. no. But I rode with him several times. I went on a trip to Japan with him, which is what opened my eyes to Bruiser Brody style. And I actually saw I step out of the dressing room every time he would go to the ring, and I saw this, and I could see them running from him. He Brody was a big guy, six six, about yeah. right at three hundred, waving that chain, going whoosh, whoosh, and those little Japanese. People, they're not, you know, they're kind of short. They're not very big. And they was they was running. And some of them were uh, actually running for their lives. Some of them were kind of laughing, kind of knowing that they, he's not going to hit them. But some of them didn't know that. And then he would just go and he would take that trip around the arena with the, in the stands with the fans. And then he'd get into the ring and they'd start the match. And I thought that was well, – and once I saw that, I said, well, hell, 
I saw what I, I knew how he worked, but that's what I wanted to see is how the fans would run from him. They would run from him, Brody and Hanson. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I can only imagine. I know his relationship, you know, behind the scenes with 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 uh, Hanson was, you know, um, something that I think was very near and dear in that way. But I, I think you bring up a really interesting point, which I I personally would love to dive into a little bit, is the fact that there was this thing sort of teetering on the edge, Dutch of you know, there was always this danger around him. Like you said, when he came into yes. the arena, to the forum, you know, you felt like anything could happen. And there was, you know, violence was about to erupt. And that was the excitement of it and the and the entertainment of it, if you will. But I think that really comes into play later. And we'll jump into this probably in a little bit. But, you know, the, the, the perception of reality for even the crowds in Puerto Rico, the night that all yes. this happened, and, you know, people not really understanding and feeling like, first of all, you know, it was, is this really a dangerous out of control guy? Was he truly a barbarian to use the word you used earlier? And if that's the case, like, you know, uh, you could, you could almost imagine when the conflict erupted, like the interpretation of that. And again, we'll come back to that, I think in a bit, but I think that was something that always was around him, but added to the excitement and the energy uh, of him, you know, and that these are the, this is the lore that surrounded this guy. Like it preceded him. And I think that's a really important aspect. And also what drew me to, the potential of telling about a guy who also was a walking dichotomy. And, you know, I would assume, you know, <laughs> the, the Dutch mentality that I know, I don't want to be presumptuous. I mean, you're, you're a super great, nice guy, but you could also play and be the, you know, the other side of you, the bad guy is that duality of character. I mean, can you speak to that? What, what is that like though, to kind of carry that and how much of that did you commit to? Cause this applies, I think to, Fr to Frank, to Bruiser is how much of that is something that you, you know, what was that like to carry that, you know, outside the ring and inside the ring? And is that, you know, for those of us who aren't, you know, don't do that and haven't had that experience, what is that mm -hmm. like? Is it, is it confusing? Is it a psychological, excuse my French mind fuck? What is that like, you know? No, it's just, you know, you just, you do it automatically. You know, Brody, when he's going down the street, he's so big. People are going to look at him because the way he looked, he looked like, don't mess with him. Yeah, He just had a sign that says, don't even speak to me. I mean, it's just the look of him. Now, if you sit down and talk to him, very intelligent man, highly yeah. intelligent. And I didn't know this till later on that he was he was an accountant. I yeah. think that, that that's, that's what that's he did. A, a former football player, and he he tried the accounting work. He told me he said hey, I, he didn't want that. And I guess he met the Fox, Dory and Terry. They kind of broke him in from West Texas State, and that's the that's same right. university that Tully Blanchard went to. I think Stan Hansen went there, uh, yeah. and a, uh, the Million Dollar Man, DiBiase, went there. And that is actually Wrestler U, is West yeah. Texas State. So, and when he got in there, he he, he had such the, uh, had so much size to him, and he was a great athlete. So he had really no, I mean, his success was built in. He carried it with him. Uh, and I've talked very little about that night in Puerto Rico hmm. uh, publicly. I've written some stuff about it. But that night in the dressing room, and it was in, in Bayamon, I, I think, but I walked in the dressing room and I immediately, I've always been able to feel like danger in the air. I don't know why I could tell something was up because the vibe in the dressing room was different. So I walked in with Brody. I rode, rode to the matches with Brody from my hotel, our hotel. I stay in the same place. Walked in there and something was different. And I sat down and me and Brody went to the back of the dressing room and we sat down and I'm just like nervous as a Something was bothering me, and I couldn't, I couldn't kind of figure it out. And I was like, "Damn, something is up here." And I don't want to say I'm some kind of psychic or something, but I had a feeling, just for judging in the room, the feeling. And I got up, and I left the dressing room. I said, "I can't sit here anymore." And I went to the dugout, which is in a baseball stadium. And we went to a dugout. I sat there about, I don't know, not long and watching the people file in and uh, 
I, I stayed there maybe five minutes, and then I went back to the dressing room, and it had already happened. I heard a bunch of screaming, a bunch of noise coming, and you got to go down the, the tunnel. And I hear the noise get louder and louder and louder the closer I got. And it's, not like, it's only like 50 feet, 60 feet maybe. And when I got to the steps to go up into the into the, the locker room, uh, it was just a den. Like, oh, well, what? get to call an ambulance, call this. Call, and I knew what something had happened. And I went in and I, I saw Mark Youngblood. And I said, what's going on? He says, Vader stabbed Brody. I went, no, Jose stabbed Brody. I went, what? Jose stabbed Brody. Because everybody in Puerto Rico's name, Jose, I didn't know who he's talking about. Sure. I said, who? He said, invader, invader. I went, what? Because, and then I go in, and the first thing I see laying on the floor was Brody. And there's some guys around him, you know, getting him water and helping him. Invader, nowhere to be seen. And the doctor was there. Well, they'd always have a doctor there, and he was attending to him. And so I said, what happened? And then somebody told me the invader called Brody into the locker shower area, and then they heard screaming, and then Brody coming out with blood on him and walking a few steps and like collapsing down on the ground, on the floor. I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I mean, um, again, this is so fascinating to get your perspective on this. I've heard, and please correct me if you understand different, but I've heard, you know, a lot of business, it wasn't unusual at that time for business to be conducted, you know, to, to like you said, to go into the yeah. kind of darkest recess of the locker room or the shower and go, let's kind of work this out. Because I think some of this supposition here is that they were trying to work out some business. And obviously there was, you know, the, there was some pretty hefty disagreements that were going on, which we can talk about too, um, what's understood. Um so, so that that what that part is not unusual. No, that, could, that's not unusual. Yeah. So, so could you could you if you don't mind, I, what I something I've always found fascinating. Could you talk about also even Puerto Rico as a setting for uh, you know wrestling and the the matches? Like I, you know, what were the crowds like? Were they different than the crowds in you know the, the mainland of the United States? And you know, oh yeah, because everybody talks about the vibe and the vibe that night. And you're talking about it in particular, but even the 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 surrounding area, it's almost like the the crowds were very like, I mean, like oh. huge crowds too, correct? Huge, huge. We we were seventeen thousand that night in the stadium. It was sold out. Big shows. Puerto Rico had a history of sellouts. Because they loved they loved wrestling, but they were very violent. Because that's what the wrestling company gave them: a lot of blood, a lot of violence. So, and it's according to what kind of security you had. Uh, you could you if they had you could look at security and tell if they were any good or not. Then you would know that when you, when your match is over, you need to get you get in. in uh, you need to get back to the dressing room. A lot of times I call it the Puerto Rican air air raid air mm. show because they would zing the hell out of you with everything they had. I've had rocks, glass, spark plugs, everything thrown at me. And it only takes something to hit you around the eyes, you know, to, but anyway, it was what, what, a, what's, a what's very that, violent what's crowd. Like, what's that like dropping into an environment like that's so different? I mean, did you, does it make you, does it change kind of your your way of like how you approach a fight, like knowing that there's this electricity? I mean, part of that's exciting, but part of it's like, I mean, nobody wants to walk into their day job and get pelted with, you know, a rock <laughs> or something, you know? <laughs> well, it's like a comedian. When you go, when you go to the ring, you you feel the temperature of the room. Yeah. You feel you can feel, like I said, I've always had a uh built-in uh, ability to feel the heat. And how dangerous a situation was, and I could tell by going to the ring. It just came to me, and I knew I knew just about how far to go, and how far not to go, because there is that tipping point. That if you go a little bit farther, you know, if you give them yeah. time, it, it could be it could be dangerous. But back to my story, and I went to the room. You know, it was a pandemonium, and. They finally, they called the ambulance finally, but it couldn't get there because the traffic was so heavy getting, and this was early in the night. 
say the matches would start, it says 8.30. Puerto Rico, they have their own time. It might be quarter after nine when they start, whenever they want to, basically. And they finally, the ambulance, somebody actually saw one on the street and knew what was going on. But there were some phone calls made, and they told them to get to the stadium. And they were close, and they got to the stadium. And then when they got down there, they saw Brody late, laid out. And it took them forever to get him out of the dressing room. And the little Puerto Rican paramedics, Brody was so big, they couldn't get him up the steps. And I remember Tony Atlas grabbed the end of it and took him up, took it to the ambulance, and they put him in, and, and Tony went to the hospital with him. I mean, part, part of the lore, whether this is, you know, and, it's, and I can only imagine over so many years, you know, things kind of become, you know, uh, mythologized in their own way. But that Tony, literally, Tony, who was there, who who has said in yeah. stories, and I don't want to speak for him, but you can kind of Google stuff and see different interviews that he's done, that he was right there. And he came in the locker room right away when he heard, I think, two screams, actually, and he came right yeah. into the locker room. But he actually had to, you know, they had there's a lot of confusion as I understand it too. Yes. Because you have, again, people not understanding, is this part of the show? Is this part of right, reality? But, what's what's really going on? But he actually physically, and like you said, Brody was a big guy. Supposedly, yeah. Tony scooped him up with his bare hands and carried him to the ambulance because the ambulance, the original, like when they first called, you know, the authorities to come and, you know, everything was that, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't get to him because the crowds were so deep and the yeah. traffic outside so it took an hour, um, yep. as I understand it, for, to even get any help. And that was crucial time because, yes, you know, he was Bruiser was still alive. He was still he was still communicating to some extent. He was mortally wounded, but was still, you know, cognizant and coherent, as I understand. Did you see any sign of that? Did you see any sign of life with him or did if I know oh, he was talking? No, he was talking. Through. He was talking. Okay, yeah, yeah. He was talking to Carlos. And I think Brody. And I'll get to another point in just a minute. I think Brody kind of realized that this might be it because he yeah. told Carlos, tell my wife I love her. Yeah. That's what he said. I remember Carlos told me that. I mean, I didn't hear him say that, but Carlos told me that. And it took the ambulance so long for help to get there. You know what he died from, right? He died um, from well, blood, blood loss. Yeah, blood loss. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And the reason they and they took him to the hospital. And he was in the hospital. And but they couldn't stop the bleeding. They actually actually did two two surgeries on him. They did one to fix what was cut. And I'll get to another point in just a minute. But then they saw they he was losing more blood and they went back in the second time. And they, they stitched him back up, but they could not stop it. I don't know why they couldn't stop the blood. I don't know why. He was yeah. in a hospital. Seemed like that would be one of the things they would know, I guess. But but after they got him out, Tony come back about an hour, hour later, and he's raising hell. And Invader's brother was in the dressing room. I remember him saying in Spanish, somebody told me he said in Spanish, he might need to shut up. He could be next. I tell you, the dressing room was now, not only did you have to worry about the fans, now the Americans were in a hostile dressing room and it shouldn't have been that way. Yeah. Now, mo mo I don't think most of the guys would have bothered us because they didn't much like it and Vader to begin with. But, and it was, and we went to the ring that night, got the matches over, I mean, my heart wasn't in it then because something like that happens. See, dressing rooms are sanctuaries. That's where you run to. If you're in trouble, you run to the dressing room. And if you got like 20 people after you, you want to try to get some support and you run to the dressing room. Now we didn't even have a sanctuary in the dressing room because it's a hostile place. So nothing happened, and I got up, and I took a quick shower, and I saw, I don't remember seeing blood on the floor, but I did earlier when I stepped in there and looked, there was some blood. Uh, but I took a shower, hopped in the car, and I asked, where did they take Brody? 
And they said Centro Medica, which is Hospital Central or something, you know, center. Mm -hmm. And I got there and we pulled in. I forgot who was with me. And this is about two two o'clock in the morning. And I saw a guy walking outside smoking a cigarette, but he had the blue scrubs on. And I went up and I said, hey, do you speak English? And he said, oh, yeah, I speak English. I said, they brought a wrestler in here, you know, earlier. Just, is he okay? And he went, oh, the big guy? He said, I, I don't know. It's, it's touch and go with him. That's all he said. I said, can I see him? He said, no, you can't see him. He's in surgery. So, and then I left. Then I went back to my hotel, the hotel that me and Brody were staying in. And I stopped by the desk and I asked the receptionist, I said, listen, if, it, if, if Brody, Frank Goodish, he gets any calls, put them through to my room. Because I knew Barbara and I didn't even know her then. I said, I, I knew she'd be calling. And I says, uh, put it through to my room. They said, okay. She said, okay, this lady did, young girl. And about four o'clock, phone rang. And it was a lady, and it was Barbara. It was Brody's wife. And she's from Australia or New Zealand. I forgot which one. She, New Zealand, yeah. But she yeah. they met in Australia, yeah. Yeah. Sydney. And she told me who she was, and is everything okay, and what's going on? And I knew it was pretty serious, but but I didn't I didn't think he would die. I didn't I think it was just something that got out of hand. And but I had no idea. I mean, that inkling never crossed my mind that he he could die. And I told her that they had there been a a, a run in, a fight, I think a scuffle. I said, I don't know. And I think it would be wise for her to get the next flight to Puerto Rico. And so we she said, okay, and I, I guess she jumped on the next flight. She was in San Antonio or around San Antonio or somewhere. That's right. And she got there the, the next morning. But the next, but before she left, I got up about 8 o'clock because I couldn't sleep. Maybe it was 7 o'clock. And I went down, and the same girl that was working the night before was there. I says, can you get me Centro Medico? Let me call the hospital. And I called. And I asked, put me through to Frank Goodish's room. And there was a pause. And they said, sir, they spoke English. Uh, Mr. Brody, uh, Mr. Goodish, he didn't have a room. I said, well, he came in there last night. Then they checked. And then I don't know if they're supposed to tell you this over the phone or not, but she says, he, he died last night. And all the... The, I would just, I just turned white and I, and I, what are you going to say? I just said, okay, thanks. And the, the girl said, how, how is he? And I says, he died. And she started crying. She didn't even know him just from checking in. And then I went out on the street. I just went for a walk. I said, I, I, I can't stay in this hotel. I got to, I went for a walk. Ran into Buddy Landale, who's passed on now, and I says, he said, how's Brody? I said, he didn't make it, man. He said, I'll stop bullshitting. I said, no, he he died. And he couldn't believe it. And then, of course, word around that Brody didn't make it. And then Abdullah left earlier that day day to leave, and, and, and he knew that Brody had passed away, and he ran into Barbara, uh, Brody's wife at the airport just passing. And I, I never will understand this, but she she knew him and she said, How's Frank? And he said something like, Oh, he didn't make it. He's gone. He's gone, just like that. And I'm thinking, what a response. I mean, surely, but and then but I I never, never, even while she she came there, I left the uh, next day. But and I didn't see her because I think she went somewhere. I don't know where she went. I'd have to ask her again where she went. But uh, and I never met her. So you came up with this idea that you would like to make a movie or some kind of a 
doc, documentary on Brody's life. So it was a strange night. It was uh, July the 16th, 1985. I remember it like yesterday. And he yeah. died on July the 17th. And I've never had a feeling like that before. And I've, I've thought about, because him and Invader, they didn't. They had a contentious relationship to begin with. They, they had a history together well before that evening. Well, I, and I, I heard all this history after the fact that they were they were both in the OWWWF, mm -hmm. and they were looking for their next, I guess, Pedro Morales or their Hispanic star. And I think that Invader was a friend of Gorilla Monsoon somehow. And they were considering him, I think, maybe. And he had a match against Brody, and Brody went out and beat the shit out of him. That's Just right. beat him up. And apparently, Invader never forgot that. Yeah. Now, later, uh, now I learned all this post-event. I learned it later. But... And I think that kind of speaks to the communication and pardon me for interrupting, but you know, so much is built around the, the, the storytelling aspect that, you know, you almost do have to use the words allegedly because, you know, as, as stories get passed on, uh, that's kind of how it was as, 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 as I understand it, and you could speak to this, but as a wrestler move from territory to territory, you share stories and you hear things of the behind the scenes of it all. So again, there was talk that, that Jose in particular made some comments about like next time, um, you know, whether that's true or not, again, that's allegedly that there was a truly a grudge there. And then when these guys were at loggerheads before this particular match, I mean, it it came down to business. I mean, at the time, as as I understand, it, it's been told to me, and this is something uh, Barbara communicated his his wife, was that, you know, Frank uh, slash Bruiser was interested in kind of, you know, creating his own, you know, uh, wrestling dynamic and you know, and, 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 uh, you know, obviously, obviously that creates competition and, you know, in a, in a sense, these guys were, you know, in conflict in the ring, but outside the ring, when it came down to the, the dollar of it all. So, well, well, what happened was, and I learned this later too. See, Gorilla Monsoon owned a piece of that company. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, Bruiser and Abdullah owned a piece of it. I didn't know that. And Brody wanted to buy in. That's right. He wanted to buy in. Now, let me go back three months before the incident with Brody. Invader lost his three-year-old daughter. She found drowned in a swimming pool. Now his That's life right. is falling apart yeah. or has already fallen apart. Now Brody is buying in. And Brody made it known that if he buys in, Invader doesn't have a job. So not, not only has he lost his daughter, now he's going to lose his job. Now, this is the second time that Brody's kind of, in his head, cut off an opportunity for him. Yeah. And I've thought about this, for, and I've, I've never said this publicly. And I sat down and I wrote, and James, I sent it to James, but the more I think about this, the more I think that when Invader went in the shower with Brody, he fully intended to kill him. Mm. I never said that before. I thought it was just self-defense. But why do you take a knife in the shower with you unless you expect something or you know something's going to go on? But, and I think, and he was... He stabbed him in the front, stabbed him in the back, cut, cut, cut some of his hair. It was a brutal attack. And I remember when I was sitting with Brody and Carlos and the doctor, and he had, I think it was on this side, I think, had two holes and they were bubbling up. And I asked, I said, what is this? What is this? He said, that's air escaping the lungs. And I went, Oh, I mean, it was, it, it's, it's surreal to a point that I don't even think you got to be thinking this can't be real. This can't be, but it was so. And, well, and I think, 
you speak to something that's interesting here is intention. And that became a, a, a you know, a, a really distinct part of the trial process, which I think we should talk about too. Um, and how you are essentially excluded from that um, as a witness. But is that, you know, again, we, these are the things we'll never know. Uh, you know, again, I want to be very careful to say these are, you know, um, the, these are suppositions. This is obviously your feelings. You were there. You had your own kind of insights and interpretations of the things. But, you know, was it that? Was there some intention to do some harm to Frank that evening? Was this a man who was there to conduct business in that kind of, you know, back alley kind of way? And he was also scared of Frank. I think it is known that Frank, you know, liked to get his way when it came to business. Um, so, you know, was he, you know, I got to take something to protect. But, but I think we can all say and take the leap. I'll say this. If, if someone's bringing a weapon with them, they damn well will probably be bringing it because they have the intent to maybe use it or could use it. So you have to ask yourself all those questions. And I think that's where it gets kind of puzzling because unfortunately there's a lot of this that is ambiguous and we won't really ever have very clear answers to because there was only two people in that in that shower room. And, yep. and, and I think I think you've said this before and only one came out of that shower room in a sense. You know? I said they were they were two people who know the truth. One is not talking and the other one is dead. So that is, that is what happened. And when they had the trial, they was going to, I, I went the day that it happened, it happened on a Saturday night that spilled over into a Sunday and it all runs in a blur to me, but we were all sitting in a room or we all went to one room in the hotel we was in and says, we need to, Call the police. They may want to talk to us. And we were leaving the next day. So we called them and they said, we'll be right there. And two detectives came over and they took us one by one down to the police station and took our, took our statement. And I, and I stated the same thing then as I stated now, except that, that last part, when he went into the shower with him, what he intended to do. I think now, but I can't prove that. And that's for debate. But when I went down there, I told them well, exactly. I've told everybody here on this podcast today and you, and I've told you this before. And uh, then I got a subpoena. I went back home. I was living in Birmingham and I went, I went home and everybody in the wrestling business news travels fast. Everybody knew it. And they was all asking me, what happened? What happened? What happened? Well, I'd have to do it in a in a a, a brief little a story that I didn't even understand myself. <clears throat> but I got a subpoena finally. The first trial was delayed and put off. The second trial, I got a subpoena. But by the time I got the subpoena, I already knew the verdict. They had mailed it late and it travels mail travels so slow i got it on a tuesday and they had the trial on a monday and i heard they had the trial and it was a really short trial and when the jury went back they they deliberated 45 minutes an hour and came out with a verdict of not innocent or guilty but not guilty by reason of self-defense, because that's what he that's what he claimed, and the well, reason okay. be reason being is because the jury were all Puerto Ricans, and Brody was painted on that TV as a wild man, right? A crazy man. So when when the his attorneys his defense attorneys got up, everybody watches wrestling there. <clears throat> they knew Brody was this wild, out of control guy. And this Puerto Rican guy, they go into a shower and they have a fight and they believe that he brought the knife with him for self-defense. And he, we would have to be, to, to be a not guilty verdict, it's got to be a 12 to zero vote of not guilty. It has to be unanimous. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's a hung jury. So he'll never be tried for this again. they are double jeopardy. They can't try him for it again. But, but I think... Invader was a, a baby face, a good guy. So everybody sided with him. 
and think, it was just you know, not guilty. Yeah, and, and I think it was Dutch, an unfortunate example of art imitating life of what we talked about, that duality of character. I think what we know of Frank um, is that he wasn't, he was anything but that. He wasn't a wild man in this kind of no. uncontrollable beast. This was part of, you know, the character. And um, I think people bought into that even in the legal setting of diving into the what they felt was the perception of what happened that evening. And I think in a way it was maybe contributed to, um, you know, the outcome, unfortunately, is, is that I perception think, I, this perception. I, th I think it did. So yeah. let me ask you this, since, since I've told you all that, I don't know if I've told you all that before, but uh, yeah, I know there's some really interesting things. Thank you for sharing. I know. Can I ask one question before you move on? Is yeah. When you, when you're telling this, and again, I'm not meaning to pry in any way, but like, I, what does that conjure for you as you're kind of recollecting that? Because, and, and also, how did that change? I mean, like, there's one thing when the stakes are so high, and yeah, you're going into environments like in Puerto Rico where, hey, anything can happen. And, you know, uh, like you said, a lug nut can come flying at my head or something. But now it's like, wow, somebody, this is, a, it's all fun and games until dot, dot, dot. Until it's, and it, yeah. And, it, and it, was, was there a different, you said news travels fast. Is this? Did you feel a change, like a, a, a you know a, a pervading specter of change across the industry post this incident? What did could you feel that, or or was that did did it not impact like that, or what was your take? And how did that affect you? Not in the United States, no. <clears throat> and down there, their business went to nothing because all the guys now nobody wants to go because right. it's if it could happen to Brody. Wait a minute. It could happen to anybody. Yeah. But see, the, the difference was, I think people could understand if it was a fan that you got so worked up and he plunged sure. the knife into I've had a lot of knives come at me. Yeah. But they could, uh, but in the dressing room against one of your, with one of your coworkers. Yeah. And then we've already covered that there was, a, there was a backstory between those two. But yeah, I didn't go back. I, I went back, but there's a reason for that. I didn't go back for seven years. And the reason being Vince, WWF, had taken over all the mom and pops. Texas was down. Florida was, I mean, Texas was gone to go there to work. Florida was gone. Mid-Atlantic was gone. Everything in Minneapolis was gone. California was gone. Oregon was gone. Because nobody they could compete with the WWF because they in, in, in TV stations used to uh, barter uh, a wrestling show. They put it on for nothing and sell ads. But sometimes they wanted you to. It's like a uh, like a pay commercial of the hour. They stopped that too. So when WWF got on there and they saw the big lights and the music and all this, nobody wanted to watch a little rinky dink local show in a little tv studio and they stopped they couldn't draw any money so they they went out of business and there was nowhere to work and i went back there in like 94 95 and i stayed like a year and then i left then i went to I ww uh, wwf you bring up a really interesting point i think this is one of the things that attracted me to the potential of telling this in a cinematic sense is that there's almost this allegory here with that exact moment like you know the, the the death of bruiser brody and that that change that shift that we were just talking about earlier that the old way of wrestling was you know the death rattle was was happening you know proverbially yeah so yeah you know and, and nothing would be the same again and i think there's a really interesting association between that incident happening and whether it had any impact on it that's not necessarily what i mean but it's just it it was like the death of an old way and, you know, now we're going to enter this new era. And I think it's really interesting that it happened at that time period, because that was, again, that was 1988. So, you know, this is when the, the WrestleManias of the world were kind of really beginning to peak. And it became, you know, the, the whole country was stopping to, you know, and again, that corporatization of wrestling that we were talking about. And, um, you know, fascinating, because from then on, shortly thereafter, uh, nothing would be the same again. And I think that's nope. um, fascinating in itself. That was a, I don't know. It was a moment in time that's immortal 
despised. And that's what attracted me to your project, because I think Bruiser Brody should be immortalized in film. All right. Uh, let me ask you, let oh, me ask influence. you this. And he was, he was the only one who really, they had like three big guys that really revolutionized Japanese wrestling too. And that mm -hmm. was Brody and that was Abdullah and that was Stan Hansen. Yeah. So if you were looking for someone to play, I'm just yeah. saying all, all out there, who would you pick to play the Brody role? Um, that is a great question. I think what you can't get around with that is his physicality. There, you know, the guy was, and this is a big part of who he was, is like you said, six six, just you know, strong as can be. Um, and you know, that 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 distinct almost like a Mediterranean type look in a way, like you know, the the, the wild hair and you know, so it's not like you can um and, and nothing to say disparaging is so you can't get like a Matt Damon who's a great actor and go, hey, we can kind of make you look like him in playing. It's just not going to work. Yeah. So that right away excludes, you know, most of Hollywood when you think of like those kind of big names that could normally like sort of uh, inhabit, like unlike Will Smith playing Muhammad Ali, et cetera. Uh, um, but I, I think there is one individual who would be very interesting because the, in, in my opinion, and in talking to, you know, a number of other people who tend to agree that is um, – the likeness is kind of uncanny is Jason Momoa actually oh, yeah. um, who, who there is, there is not just a resemblance, but there seems to be sort of an energy that Jason has. Like one of the things that we talk about when describing and thinking about Frank is that, you know, and, and bruiser is that he did it his way. You know, that those words like outlaw rebel outlier. And I think um, Jason in particular also kind of encompasses that there's kind of this kind of like free spirited kind of vibe about it. So I think those things combined, he would be the the prototype for this. Um, and that'd be something that, you know, again, I'm just putting it out there. We'd love to explore um, mm -hmm. in, in that way. If not, you would probably go the route, again, from a cinematic sense of what other movies, like the movie on um, that they did on Biggie Smalls or even Tupac, where they found someone who resembles and is a great actor, but was finding an unknown potentially to play that part. Because there's not many actors in Hollywood that can you know, really kind of live up to the physicality part of it too. And, and I think, and not that we'll get really deep into this, but, you know, we keep talking about the bruiser that everybody knew, excuse me, <clears throat> in the ring. But I come back to that duality of character. Who he was behind the scenes. He was a, we, we you and I have gotten to know Barbara quite well, his wife. She's yeah. the most lovely human being in the entire world, by the way. I mean, just lovely. And so much of her shortened life with frank in particular they had a son together um all the way up to now um you know you can tell this still 35 years later and of course i think we can understand this it's she still carries this with her i mean this is it's traumatic i mean that she they there there's was i mean it sounds like some hollywood kind of sentiment or statement but there was a love story and that was another part of frank i mean he was that guy he was evidently a great father and loved his son immensely and he 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 there was a yin and a yang to him like you know and that's what is so interesting about characters and he had his flaws he had his flaws you know he 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 had a reputation that preceded him that wasn't just part of the act that you know he could be difficult and he was he wasn't an, a yes guy which also i think is inspiring and speaks to a certain um aspect that people respond to when they talk about those kind of iconic people that will you know, like kind of say, excuse my French, fuck you to the system. I mean, Frank was like, no, I mean, listen, we're going to, you know, it's my way of the highway kind of thing. But all those things kind of play into the fact of like, wow, how much of that also contributed to, you know, this experience that I had in Puerto Rico in some sense, you can explore that. And I think, um, so, so back to your thing, I think like a Jason Momoa would be really interesting, you know, and, and would be amazing. And um, he yeah, looks that would, oh, he would be great. And you know, since we we've started talking about you doing the the feature on him, I'm thinking I'm I'm trying to put together what I would see, and I don't know, but you know, I don't know how you would do. How would you do the crowd scenes? Well, but first of all, we bunch. definitely have to we have to get out of the way that obviously, if anybody was playing Dutch Mantel, it would be Brad Pitt. So let's just get that out of the way first and foremost. Oh yeah, yeah, well, of, so, course, yeah of course. Yeah, that goes without saying. Of course. Um, 
No, no uh, all kidding aside. I mean, listen, this is what's amazing about technology these days is the ability to actually, you know, to, I, I mean, look, it depends on where you drop into the story. And there's a lot of ideas about this. You you can go back in Bruiser's career. And, you know, I think one of them, um, I mean, Ric Flair has said that one of his favorite fights they ever had was with Bruiser in the then Checker Dome in St. Louis, Missouri. And, you know, you're talking about 30, 35,000 screaming fans. And that's, yeah. you know, and, and and to be able to capture that, because that's regionally what wrestling could pull, you know, when it was at its yes. best, you know, and I think that's so exciting to see that to then flashing forward to, you know, the end in 1988 and uh, June 16th, and you go down to Puerto Rico and, you know, to feel the intensity of that crowd. So, yeah, I mean, look, you know, the, the technology is there. I mean, you'd love to think about doing things like in a practical sense where you can get big crowds to come to something nowadays through you know, CGI, even the controversy of AI and what can be replicated. I mean, you can we, we you can make this look as authentic as humanly possible that the the naked eye would never know the difference as you're watching this in a film. And I think that's exciting about that. I mean, I love how they did the um the natural when they did that with Robert Redford. And because that was many years ago before the implementation of where CGI is gone. And you know, they they filled the crowd with with actual bodies and extras, but they also had cardboard cutouts and stuff and you know it's, mm -hmm. it's fascinating i this is the part that i could and this is probably for a different audience but you know the magic of movie making is is exciting in its own way but it's all entertainment isn't it it's all it's all entertainment well when i heard about this you know i was i was excited because i think if anybody needs to have a movie made about them it is about it was a, it was a moment in time that i don't want to relive but it is history and I think Absolutely. the story needs to be told. I think you will find out that the reception from wrestling fans will be there because I think they would want to see it. And I was going to ask you one more question or a couple more questions. Well, well, I can't... Actually, if I can jump in, I've got two questions. While you're thinking of the questions, Dutch, I've got two for both of you, if uh, you don't mind indulging me. Uh, the first thing... And I've never asked you this, Dutch. In fact, I've never asked either of these questions. Is The first one is, back in 1990, Onita goes to Puerto Rico, and he uh -huh. is going to wrestle Invader in Japan, where I think he's going to beat uh, Invader. And they reenact the stabbing. Yes. This time in storyline. Do you remember hearing about that at the time? Do you remember seeing no, that roughly? No, I heard about it. Uh, I heard Sean, about it. Sean, do you know about this as well? I, I've heard about this. I haven't seen it, but that, that just, I, I mean, even as you're recount, and I've heard this before, it just makes your heart go like, what is going on yep. here? I mean, that is just a whole nother level of uh, inappropriateness. And just like, how do you, uh, I, yeah, I can't even wrap my brain around that at all. It was bullshit. Yeah. I mean, Onita was, he was an outlier in the wrestling business too. Started his own company over there and, it was just wild and it was just all kind of gimmicks and, but Onita well, was, and, and it was, it was a su su successful company, but very, very bad taste. Yeah. I mean, um, a man loses his life, but yet you're going to go down and reenact that invader stabs him just to draw a house in Japan. I, I don't James, get it. Just, just knowing how this, you know, Knowing Barbara, um, and you know, and there, there's a real family connected to this. And when you hear those kind of things, it just makes you go, "This is not what this is supposed to be. This is not the right spirit at all. This is this seems, it seems exploitive." Again, I've not seen it, so I don't want to be overly judgmental. But at, at you know, surface, it it seems like a, a very inappropriate move. I'm looking at the photo of it right now. So even I can't show the photo, uh, but uh, I'll show it on screen afterwards. I'll edit it in if I can. But uh, if you looked at it, you think. Hmm, that is as inappropriate as it gets. And when you you two were talking about Invader being a good guy, and that's probably why he got away with the crime in the first place. I mean, I'm I don't know. Maybe even the fans probably cheered him when this happened, or he was still seen as the good guy. Now stabbing a second bad guy in the in the space of less than two years. Can I say ahead, something hit. about that, James? Oh, go go ahead. Go ahead. Gosh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to make one thing clear, something that is understood. And again, it speaks to the complexity of why everything went down like it did. And what we could call is the potential for lack of justice is the fact that, you know, Invader or Jose Gonzalez, you know, was perceived as a pillar of the community in Puerto Rico. 
um, in the sense that he was beloved and he was a star and he was the hero and he was a good guy. So again, the behind the scenes of reality may or may not be very different, but you know when you have the the sort of court of public opinion, um, on, you know, kind of perceiving this in one way, and we go back to what we were saying that, you know, well, Bruiser is a wild guy. He is he is a bad guy. I mean, he probably was ready to you know, with his teeth you know gnashing, ready to draw blood and stuff. And so you know, so it does get very you know kind of interesting in that way. Um, but that's just just to give some context. I think it's important to to say that that the setting and the community that Invader was immersed in, you know, there was a perception of him, uh, and it is what it is. Yep, yep. I, I have nothing to add. It, but I came to that conclusion years and years ago that the wrestling jury, I mean the jury, was made up of wrestling fans because you pick a jury. And I don't know what the questions they asked them, but I guess one of them, do you watch wrestling? And of course the defense wanted people who watch wrestling because Brody was a wild man. That was his gimmick. That was his whole deal. And people would run from him. So quite naturally, if the fans were scared of him, it'd be quiet. That was, that was in, in Vader's defense that he acted in self-defense, which I've learned later that I've come to a different conclusion on it when I figured all this stuff in. And when I came to that conclusion that maybe he intended more than just a confrontation, then it dawned on me that, yeah, that could possibly be true. I'm not saying that that is true, but I'm saying, I don't know. It was just things that all came together at one spot at one time in a little place on the earth, Puerto Rico. And I think it shattered a lot of lives. And I don't know. It was, I wish I, I, I wished a million times I'd never really, I had never happened. And then I wished a million times I hadn't even, even been there. Yeah. So it's a hard thing. You know, you hear about things that, you know, you can't get it out of your head. You just can't leave it. And that's one thing that I cannot leave is seeing Brody laying on the floor and that going on. And it's, it's the old saying, it's something you can't unsee. And every time I, every time I talk about it or think about it, that's what I see. And I wish I didn't see that, but What's your next question, James? Um, this one you may want to cut out. Uh, it's entirely up to you, uh, but it's the big question. It's for both of you, and I'll, I'll open it up to you first, Sean. Uh, occasionally accounts, uh, I think maybe Tony has said this, but maybe I've just misremembered this, is that he also said that maybe Carlos was in the, uh, in the shower with Invader. The question is, what, if anything, do you think Carlos Colon knew about Invader's plans? with Brody that night. Yeah, I mean... No, one, no go ahead. You, go ahead. No, You're the uh, guest. I'll, I'll just say, because I will defer this to Dutch, there is so much speculation about that and, again, what reality is there. And I think the more time that passes, you know, the 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 memory kind of creates its own narrative in a way that, you know, it's from, from what I understand, it's quite unknown. But I'll let Dutch speak to that if he has any insight into that. But that's a very, very interesting and complex point in and of itself it really is well let me go back to when i entered the the dressing room that night you got you come in the concourse and you're walking down to the to the dressing room or the locker room or where the baseball team gets dressed and and you go in and you open the door and right in front of you is like a coach's box and it was carlos cologne Invader and Jovica, one of the owners, they were sitting in there. And, and nobody spoke. We just went in, which is another thing that kind of set my antenna up. But Invader was putting on a, the, a leather thing right here. You know, he wears them on both, and he was tying it up. And I said, you know, that's strange I mean I didn't think all this you know right then it, was, it came later 
But I do think, I think Invader was the only one who had a confrontation in mind. Jovica's a lot of things, but being a part of a murder, I don't think so. Carlos is a good guy. He really is. I mean, I've had my differences with him, but I think him being a any part of this, no, I don't I don't think so. Because they were businessmen. They knew that if something like this happened, they needed Brody. They needed him for business. They don't want to get him hurt. Damn sure didn't want to get him killed, I don't think. But I think Invader didn't tell them he was the booker. Invader was the booker. He didn't tell them nothing, and I think he went out there, and like we said, he called him in the shower, and he went, uh, from what I've heard, I was out in the, I was out in the dugout when all this happened. And he went and he said, Brody, uh, can I see you in here? And Brody said, yeah. He got up and walked in there. And they weren't in there long, and then that's that's where they heard the, the the shouts and the screams or whatever, and a big commotion. And then Brody comes staggering out of the of the shower, and nobody saw Invader for the next hour because he stayed in the shower. And Jovica went in there and said, "What the hell are you doing?" I heard some screaming in there too, between Jovica and and Invader, and they were screaming at each other, but in Spanish because I couldn't tell what they were saying. But something was going on, and but I don't think Carlos and Jovica. I don't think they had anything to do with it. I think they were just out in the cold, like the rest of us. Any more, James? There, um, no, that was my heaviest question. Thank you for answering it. Uh, any? Well, you had one more question. Did you remember it? I can't remember it now. But but anyway, I, I want to tell uh, Sean. I appreciate you including me in your our few discussions that we've had. Uh, you call me every now and then, Sean, and keep me updated on the on the progress of of, of your project. And I wish it a lot of success. I think it will do well, and uh, I, I'm interested in seeing the finished product. No, listen, it's a real pleasure to. I've gotten to know you behind the scenes of it all and to connect on this subject in particular and get to know you a little bit more. And uh, I, I agree. I think this, I think that there is, they're, they're calling it right now. This kind of, uh, I hate this term is kind of goofy, but retro mania that, you know, um, we're all kind of rediscovering these great, you know, kind of icons in, in our kind of pop culture and cultural history. And it's great to find these stories and, and tell a story like, Frank's because it deserves to get told, and unfortunately, it didn't end in a, in a good way. Um, and I, and that is a part of the story, but I think it needs to be told. And he has a legacy that you know a lot of wrestling fans and and people that are really immersed in wrestling history have a real appreciation for this guy. But let's not forget yeah. this is a guy that really could have gone down as a, a name as big as the biggest names, and his life was cut short. You know, and I think there's a tragedy in that. Like, you know, that, you know, that's the unfortunate part of all this, too. Well, sometimes when you dig back deep into Brody's work, he, he in Japan, especially, sure. he wasn't considered a wrestler. He was like more like a god. Yeah, he was still. Is. And and I read the reason he started taking that and waving that chain around his head is to keep people away from him. Because when he would go, people would want to touch him. And he wanted the people to stay back from him. That's why he took the chain. But wow. to see how they reacted to him. And I can see see the appreciation for wrestling. And I don't know how it is now. But years ago was totally different than the United States. The Japanese fans were always very polite. They didn't have chairs. They would sit on the floor, literally, and they'd bring a little thing to sit on, and they would sit on the floor and were very quiet doing the matches. I mean, for an American wrestler, I went over there, and they're so quiet. And they told me I, they, they're they going to be quiet. And I'm thinking, damn, am I doing something wrong or what? They're not saying nothing. But and when, when a, a comeback was made, they wouldn't scream for the comeback to be made, but only on the punches. Whoa. 
them quiet. Wow. And it was like a kind of a medley, uh, a melody going on. But very, very unique fans, very polite. And it's something that if you've never witnessed or experienced, it's a it's a totally different feeling. Uh, you know, I, I, I love that you brought that up. And I just want to say one thing about that. If anybody gets a chance who hasn't had a chance to see some of these great, again, iconic matches in Japan, it is almost like a temple-like experience because of the reverency that it feels like. The vibe in the room is vastly and culturally different than it is in the United States. And it is fascinating. I can only imagine as a performer, because you do kind of feed off that energy, it's a very different kind of energy. It doesn't mean the energy is not there, but it is. It's not loud and boisterous and electric like that. It is It's. It is like a. It's almost like a church or a temple in some sense. And I think that speaks to something like when you use that word that he was perceived like there's only a, a few of them like that, but that even to this day, like he's, he's revered. He's like, he was like a God there. Um, and speaks to how talented the guy was too. Let's not forget. I mean, the talent yeah. was ridiculous. It was off the charts. I mean, <laughs> off the charts. You know? And somebody said, well, why did guys like Abdullah and Hanson and Brody get over so strong in Japan? I said, well, one reason they beat the shit out of people. Yeah. Yeah. It, but, they put those guys in there and they just beat the living crap out of them. And then I don't care how bad you beat them up. I'd see them in a dressing room. They'd go up to Brody. Oh, Saku, uh, Saku. They were th <laughs> and they were appreciative that he actually beat them up and they, they were probably hurting. Uh, let me ask you the last couple of deals. When do you think that a decision will be made on, on your documentary or your movie? Yeah. So how close? So, uh, how close? How close are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, or listen, how far um, are you away? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. I don't want to sound self-serving here, but um, I'll, I'll mention just a little bit of my background because this will kind of answer the question. I'll do it super quick. Is that I just finished a true life crime project, a true life drama uh, called American Outlaws, which was based on the true life story of the Doherty Gang, which was these three siblings that went on this Christ country crime spree in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, I only bring that up because. You know, these stories seem to be very popular these days, you know, true life stories that could have a crime or thriller aspect to them. Um, so, you know, this is a very popular genre. And obviously the Brody story in particular also encompasses the whole wrestling fandom and people are just crazy for wrestling these days. There are other film projects about other, you know, um, you know, talent that are that are being made as we speak. So I personally I have another film that's going in September. Uh, but in the meantime, we are hyper developing this as we speak um it's you know doing doing research on this and now i'm in the process of writing the script um and and you know that is you know it's, it's the artist's way in some sense that it, you know there's days when it's moving along very fast and there's days when you know you you do you get kind of stuck on certain things so i would say that this is the kind of thing like by you know early next year the script should be finished and that will be in a place of actually you know what we're saying is putting the film together casting you know, looking at production dates, et cetera, would be the idea. Um, you know, there's a lot. I will, hey, without saying too much, there are a lot of very, very interested parties in the story in particular because there's a lot of fans. There's a lot of fans of wrestling. They know the audience is there. There's an amazing built-in loyal audience, uh, you know, to, to seeing something like this and particularly with Bruiser's story. So um, that's been really great to see too, that he isn't forgotten and there is this indelible legacy that he's left behind that, you know, Your hopefully heads. we could do some great justice to. Last question. Yes, sir. Do you have, do you have a name for it? Um, no, other than the one that I've been using is I like the idea of bruiser, you know, just to keep it kind of short, sexy and sweet in that, that way. But, um, I think, I think that that remains to be seen. We'll see that stuff changes all the time. And then, you know, you get a lot of input from the marketing side on what kind of works and translates and all that. But I think, um, you know, it, it really is about, a, a, you know, it's, it's a character piece. So, mm -hmm. you know, just much like you see a title like Ali, you know, going back to the Will Smith example of the Muhammad Ali story. I mean, that kind of says it all, doesn't it? You know, it sure it does. Something. That, and that name really evokes something. You know, it yeah, does. It, it you does. Hear that, you know, from a descriptive adjective standpoint, you're like, oh, wow, this, you know, there's. If you, if you, by the way, if you Google and you start typing in the words bruiser, you get to the word bruise and bruiser immediately like that, that comes up like that's, you know, it's associated to him. And, you know, he, he wore that, he wore that moniker of that name he did. and wore well. Yeah. 
Well, on behalf of James and I, I want to thank you very much because we've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time. And I brought it up to James a couple of weeks ago and he said, man, yeah, because, and you know, James, the thing about him, he's not really a wrestling fan. He looks up everything because I asked him, are you a wrestling fan? He's no, not really. I just research it. And he does a great job. And he says the anniversary of Bruiser Brody's death is coming up. So this would be a, a, a great time to, to have your friend on. So I appreciate you coming on. And ladies and gentlemen, why it's dark there it doesn't matter because people will watch this at different time. But uh, Sean is currently in the in Australia. Yeah, and it's I'm actually it's, it's two o'clock city. in the morning there. Yeah, two it's o'clock about now. two o'clock in the morning. So this is the same city and and not too far from where uh, where Frank met Barbara, his wife, in Kings Cross. And that's an interesting thing too. And I'll, I'll conclude with this, but. You know, at that time, a lot of the wrestlers that were coming to the Australian market to wrestle, Mm -hmm. you know, she was working, um, you know, how they used to have it designed was they have these like little kind of boutique hotels in a very sort of nefarious neighborhood called King's Cross, which is kind of like everything goes where a lot of this. And you did you ever wrestle down? You you did. No, I never, never went there. Okay, okay. So like, you know, a lot of the servicemen when they were on leave during the Vietnam War would come. Yeah, there's a lot of sex drugs and rock and roll going on during that time period in the king's cross area but she was she was working as she tells the story in this hotel um and you know the hotels connected to it always are connected to a pub at the at the base at the bottom so you kind of was yep. all encompassing so you could stay there and go downstairs have a drink have a pint you know have some food and stuff so um the one that she worked at a lot of the wrestlers stayed at so she would see every shape and size she saw the andre the giants of the world who were there at the time wrestling and you know the um you know, uh, I want to use the correct word, the words that were used at the time to describe the, the midget, the small people wrestlers. I don't yeah. want to use that term and offend anybody. But, um, but you know, so so everything under the sun, it was like a circus atmosphere. And one day uh, in walks to check into the hotel was was Frank. And um, she said he was very quiet, very reserved, kind of kept to himself, was not a drinker, uh, you know, was not out partying with the rest of the guys. Um, there's a lot of stories about that stuff. Um but he was very respected even then. And um, and they really connected, and that's their love story. And again, that's another story for another time. But yeah, this that's in this not too far from where I am right now. Okay. Appreciate your time. Great stories. I think this will be one of our better podcasts. And James, I appreciate you running the control board. And uh, are you ready to say goodbye, James? Goodbye, James. <laughs> thank you james for everything and thank you dutch i appreciate you You guys are amazing thank you okay till next week we the people okay.